Buddhism in its practice is a set of lists. And I always, every time I make that statement, I think of this fellow that came here twice with a, an enormous chip on his shoulder. And I always wonder why people come someplace with an enormous chip on their shoulder. And uh, he came to our sutra class one winter. And as we were going into the sutra, I made that comment. Oh, we'd like to make lists, or somebody liked to make lists. And um, he immediately spoke up and said, well, that's one of the things I don't like about Buddhism. And I have always, every time I say that phrase now, I think of him. Turned out he was a lawyer. And uh, I never knew what his problem was because he only came twice. But one of the very well-known short lists is for the practitioner of meditation. And it states that uh, three things have to be developed along the way in order for an awakening. One of those things is effort. A great effort has to be made. And another one of those things is great doubt. And the third is to have great faith. And they, like many of the list of things, there isn't a one, two, three. And of course, this always causes confusion because we think in a linear manner. And okay, what's the first step? Well, is the first step great effort? And we come and we sit in an uncomfortable position and our knees and our back and start to hurt and maybe the legs go to sleep. And if that doesn't hurt, then our head hurts because we're trying to be clear and we find that not so easy. So effort must be the first thing we must make. But without a faith that there's something to make an effort over, then why would anyone, if they didn't at least have some faith, even make a great effort? Because it just doesn't make any sense. It's kind of like this guy. Why did he come? I don't know. Maybe he came looking for a fight. Maybe there was nobody to argue with in Victorville, so he came out to Lucerne Valley to uh, see if he could pick a fight. Not a great deal of faith there. Not even sure about the effort, but he was looking for a fight. Didn't get one. So there has to be some faith. And then doubt. What is that doubt about? Well, the doubt can be expressed in many, many different ways. And teachers over the vast sum of time that we've been practicing the Buddha way have used that in different ways to instruct their students and to encourage them. So there's more than one answer about what we're doubting. But one obvious thing we have to doubt is our perception. The Buddha spent a great deal of time trying to explain to people that their perception was faulty. No matter how intelligent, how educated, how devoted they were, they had this faulty perception of reality and, of course, of themselves because we are part of reality. And so there must be some doubt about that perception. Well, I can't imagine anybody having a real doubt about the perception and whether they see things clearly. And then continuing to practice without having a certain amount of faith that the practice is going to lead to something. Now, we've all met people that go from church to church or practice to practice or fad to fad looking for the silver bullet. And of course, I always have to smile because I've met many of these people and one of the things that distinguishes them is that they're looking for somebody that agrees with them, which kind of gets in the way of great doubt. Because if you find someone that agrees with you 100%, then why do you have to search? There's nothing to find. You've got all the answers already. So you can simply stay home, eat some cold cereal, watch some cartoons, and be satisfied that you have the answers to all the mysteries in the universe. 
And while this is going on, while we have this faith and we have this doubt, we have to make some effort to do something about it. This issue of doubt and faith exists on another level. When I went to study with my first te second teacher, I uh, had no doubt that uh, he was my teacher. Uh, when I went and had an interview with him about doing formal study with him, uh, there was nothing I didn't like. And I walked out of there with him saying to me, well, come to my Tuesday night class and uh, see if you really want to do this. And if you want to do this, then we're going to have a ceremony in December and, and uh, uh, then you can formally become my student. Well, walking out the door, I remember him saying that to me and I said yes and thank you very much and I'll be there on Tuesday, thinking there is no doubt here about the teacher. Later on, doubt arose. But at that time, I had no doubt that this certainly was my teacher. And as time went by, I continued to go to the class. And in December, we had a ceremony, and I took ordination under him. And um, I asked him at that time, I said, well, is it all right if I stop coming to the Tuesday night class? And he looked at me and he said, well, of course, because I had a Tuesday night service, meditation service at my temple in Long Beach. And I said, uh, I would like to start doing that again. And he says, I, I didn't realize. He said, you only had to come a couple times just to see who I was, to see if you wanted to study with me. But I had continued. Well, that was good that I had, because by the time the ceremony came up, there was no doubt at all. But there were times that I suffered doubt, and interestingly enough, looking around at the people that I practiced with, the other monks and nuns that were his disciples, and when he was alive, there were always quite a few of them, uh, all of their doubts didn't look like my doubts. And at the time, I just kind of became stoic and pushed on through and didn't worry about it. And of course, I'd been raised by a Japanese, so um, it was very, it made me very uncomfortable, some of their doubts. They worried about all kinds of very important things like uh, what color robe they wore, why they should have to wear a certain color robe, why they should have to wear a robe at all, why they should have to cut their hair, why they should have to chant, why they should chant in Vietnamese. Well, why couldn't they chant in English? Why should they have to chant in English? Why should they have to practice this degenerate form of Buddhism? Surely they should be allowed to practice primal Buddhism. Oh, I, I love that when they'd say it. We want to go back to primal Buddhism. And I had visions of these people that lived in comfortable rooms with television sets and flushing toilets, living out in a typical Indian forest, for about a day and a half until they came screaming back into town looking for a reasonable arrangement, reasonable arrangement, where they would have some privacy and a shower and a flushing toilet and three meals a day and shoes to wear. But they wanted primal Buddhism, whatever that might possibly be. But my doubt was um, a little different. Uh, I remember the first time I saw someone hug my teacher. And uh, I was scandalized. I remember, raised by Japanese. Don't ever touch the Roshi. This lady went up and just put this big bear hug on my teacher. And he gave it back. And I... Didn't, I was awestruck that this could take place. The Vietnamese are certainly the other end of the pole when it comes to touchy-feely in Buddhism. Zen being on one end where they don't touch and don't feel anything, and Vietnamese Zen 
Japanese Zen being that way, Vietnamese Zen being the complete opposite, where they're so casual you can get confused and think that they're too casual. And the next thing that I didn't really doubt that, because he was such a human being, he was so normal that it just allowed another piece to fall into place. But one day he was talking and he uh, told a story of being in a parade in Japan. And he'd lived quite a few years in Japan, was published in Japan, took all three of his college degrees in Japan. This was a pretty Japan guy. And uh, he even liked sake, which is hard to understand sometimes why someone would like sake. He even drank cold sake. But he was in a parade and he was wearing his uh, Buddhist robes and he was wearing the stole or the kesa that goes around the shoulders. And the Japanese uh, have a unique, distinct look to their kesa. I have no idea why this took place, but unlike the Vietnamese and the Chinese and the Koreans, they wear their kesa, at least to me, inside out. They put all the little flaps where it's sewed, the pieces are sewed together, they put it on the inside, and the outside is smooth. And so he was walking along and he had his kesa on, and it had all these pieces, like I'm illustrating to you right now, sticking out. And some old Japanese grandmothers started yelling at him, saying, that monk, he's got his case on backwards. He's got his case on backwards. And I guess everybody said, oh, turn your case around. You've got it on backwards. And finally, he acknowledged them by saying, what's the matter with you? I am a Zen master. I know how to wear my kesa, and continued to walk. I was in big trouble when I heard him say that, because I thought, oh, ego. He was a Zen master. And so he didn't take correction by people standing at the side of a parade. Later on, not on a regular basis, but just about the time I would get comfortable and I had rationalized his behavior, I had allowed him to be human. He'd say it again. He'd say something like that. And I'd, and I'd just, oh, I'd look around without turning my head out of the corner of my eyes to see if the other monks and nuns had reacted to his incredibly inflated ego to call himself a master. Nobody reacted. It didn't bother anybody else. And after a while I started to wonder, I wonder why it doesn't bother them. Could they be that much more developed than me? Could they understand more deeply what was going on? Did they have some insight from years of practice that I had not gained? Now they were still arguing about things like, why do we have to do ceremonies? The Buddha didn't do ceremonies. See, they didn't study very much. Why do we have to do this? Why do we have to do that? It was a, it was a constant litany of complaint. They wanted everything as comfortable as they could get it so that they really didn't have to change the way they led their lives. All they had to do was take on a new title. And then one day, I realized, as my teacher said, when you're the Zen master, you can change the rules because somebody had complained once again about the many, many rules we have to follow. And why couldn't we change them since this was a now America? And da 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 The broken record went on. And Tianan answered them with a smile on his face. And I remember it vividly because 
He never, this never bothered him. Bothered me, didn't bother him. He was sitting there, he used to wear flip-flops most of the year, you know, the kind of shower shoe type things. And he was sitting there, and it was a casual meeting. And he was sitting there in this room, and everybody was assembled, and he was talking about the summer training, Anku, which was coming up, and explaining the rules for Anku to all the people there, because we always had a variety of monks and nuns. There were his disciples, but then I remember that year there were a couple Theravada monks living there, and there was a Tibetan monk, and so he explained the Anku. I remember the Theravada monk saying that he had worked very, very hard during the year, and that he just wanted to take a little vacation during the summer training period. And my teacher, I remember him saying, you know, I've talked to some people at the other temples that you stayed at, and I discovered that this is your normal behavior. If you want to stay here, you will participate in Anku. If you don't want to participate in the training, then you need to find some place else to stay. And so this guy shut up. And then somebody said, why do we have to do this? It disrupts my whole schedule and my whole life, and I've got everything planned out. You know, on the one hand, the practice of Buddhism is very comfortable for control freaks. For the anal retentive. On the other hand, it's not so comfortable because if you have a good teacher, about the time you get comfortable, he shakes things up. And he catches you, he blindsides you, he makes you do something that you didn't expect to do. And so they were carrying on about, you know, this is an old tradition and we don't need to do it because we're Westerners and we're highly developed and we're highly civilized and we don't need to train because we got all the answers in the first place, uh, yada, yada, yada. And he said, you know what, when you're the master, you can change the rules because when you're the master, you can operate from your own wisdom. That's my addition there. But he said, until then, we will do things as they've always been done. And when he said that, another piece fell into place for me. See, I've never forgotten when he said that, because it was so important to everybody but me. Because I had no desire to change anything. Remember, I went there to finish my training. I didn't know that I was supposed to be telling somebody how to train me. I thought I was there to get trained. And having done this for a number of years, I knew there were times that I didn't understand why we did things. And I knew there were times that I didn't always agree with the things. And I knew there were times where I just didn't understand. But I also knew that training was about accepting and immersing yourself in these doubts and in these awkwardnesses and in this uncomfortableness at times and learning to move through it. And so I'd been operating the same way with the great master Tianan. And then I remembered when he said that, that one of his favorite comments was, as he would have us do things and teach us to do things, was, when you are the master, you need to be able to do this. When you are the master, you must set a good example. When you are the master. And I realized that maybe when he turned to that lady and said, Leave me alone. I'm a Zen master. I know how to wear my robe. It was an ego. Maybe it was a statement of fact. And maybe no ego needed to be present. And I thought of the guy putting a roof on a house, and some passerby came by and looked at him and didn't like the way he was doing it and said, Hey, you, you're not nailing that down right. And the guy ignored him. And again, he yelled up to the guy on the roof and said, Hey, you're using too small a nail. You're using too big a nail. Your nails are too close. Your nails are too far away. Hey, my brother-in-law did one of those, and he did it right. You're not doing it right. And finally, the roofer probably would throw a box of nails at him or something because he'd say, Leave me alone and let me do my job. Because the only person who can really tell what's going on up on the roof is the guy that's building the roof. And the guy, unless he's a master roofer standing on the ground, really, the angle's a little skewed. It's a little hard to tell how close the nails are. 
Can you tell how big a nail is in somebody's hand 30 feet away from you? Probably not. And so that day I realized this wasn't an ego statement because I'd been involved in Japanese Zen where you worry a lot about ego. I realized this was just a statement of the fact. And that let another thing fall in place for me. When the historical Buddha, the thus come one, the Tathagatha, he who has arrived, used to make me really uncomfortable when I'd read the Pali Sutras, the way the Buddha would talk about himself. And then I thought, well, this could be a guy on a roof going, excuse me, mister. Get away from the roof. Something might fall on you. I'm busy putting the shingles down. But you're not doing it right. Okay, just get away from the roof so I can finish shingling this house. No ego. You don't have to have ego to have confidence. You have to have faith, and you have to have doubt, and you have to have effort, but you don't have to have ego. You have to have faith that you know what you're doing that the path that you're on is going to take you to the end. You have to have doubt that you know everything. There's nothing like a great teacher who can say, I don't know. And you have to have effort. And effort is just one foot in front of the other. That's all it is. It's just building good habits and keeping it going. But it's also not becoming complacent. So, I had a doubt about Tianan. I don't have that doubt anymore. When he died, many people had doubts. They misunderstood. To be enlightened is to be so normal that nobody can tell. To be enlightened is just to be you. <laughs>